Hello, and welcome to this week's Glass Tire Top 5. It is the week of July 16th, 2020. I'm Brandon Zeck. I'm Christina Reese. And uh, this is a special Dog Days of Summer one we got for you this week. So this same week, uh, last year, we did the top five, our our top five favorite artworks about snow and ice. Mm -hmm. And we thought, what better? I mean, it's pushing 100 in Texas right now. Just the normal temperature feels like much more. Um, If you are going outside, you're feeling it, especially during the pandemic when, I don't know, Christina, you and I both kind of, our outlet has been to walk around outside. That's not happening nowadays. Well, I'm walking. I just have to get well. up earlier and earlier in the daytime to do it because it is. And in the city of Houston sends out this heat advisory via email to all of its citizens. So every single morning there's a city of Houston heat advisory because it says the index is somewhere between 105 and 111. And it does feel like it. So all of that aside, this week is our favorite uh, Texas artworks about heat. So all of these artists have had some intensive connection to Texas. Most of them still live in Texas if they are still alive or they had a significant portion of their career in Texas. So we could have just opened this up and done all artists doing hell and heat and fire and it just would have gone on and on. And you and I were doing research that had opened it up beyond Texas. And then we realized that actually Texas artists have been dealing with this forever and uh, there's no reason not to just keep it Texas centric so that is what we have done. Uh, number five on our list is Alexander Ho. He did a he did a series of drought paintings in the 30s, uh, the big dust bowl uh, that happened and he was part of the Dallas Nine and he taught and lived in Texas for years and years and this is called I think it's called Drought Survivors. Yeah, and it's drought, from 36. That's right and so it's a very cheerful <laughs> Uh, he was he was a little down on uh, the kind of the agriculture industrial complex and what it was doing to the land. But um, yeah, two cattle are uh, very dead. There's a rattlesnake. There's a prairie dog. The rattlesnake and the prairie dog are alive, by the way. The tractor is a ba- long abandoned. Yeah, so this uh, this belongs to uh, the Musée National d'Art Modern in Paris. This is uh, not here in Texas. It's not at the Amon Carter, which we would have probably assumed. But I kind of love that, though, because it's so... This is so like the stereotypically Paris version of like Texas. Number four this week is, uh, it's a whole series of photographs by uh, a photographer based in Austin named Sandy Carson. So I actually wrote about a show of this work that was at Pump Project sometime in the last three, four years. Um, These were also on view at Lawndale Art Center in Houston in the last three, four years. These are photographs that, Sandy took at concerts, but instead of doing, you know, the normal concert photography where he's photographing the bands, he turned his camera around and photographed like the front row of the audience. Just kind of the psychology behind these photos is so interesting because you're seeing, you know, the front row audience's unabashed adoration of like their musical heroes who are right in front of them. So it has a psychological aspect, but also if you've ever been in a pit at a concert, you can feel the heat in these photographs and just, you know, it's kind of the pre COVID world of bodies pushed up close together, people wiping their hair away from their face. People have red cheeks because some of these are like at outside festivals It's the perfect embodiment of what it is to be in the front row at a concert and to stand there for four hours, five hours through all of the opening bands and then kind of finally have that release with everyone else. Yeah, you can feel the stickiness. You can feel what it's like to get home late at night after one of these concerts and just like go straight to the shower because you can feel the heat. That's for sure. It looks hot and sticky because... As we know, it is. is. Uh, Next on our list, I'm not sure people will be particularly surprised that we picked this, but it's Luis Jimenez. It's one of his iconic works. It's called Man on Fire. It's early. It's from 1969. Um, I was surprised at how early this piece was. It is. It's one of his giant fiberglass sculptures, obviously. The Smithsonian has it. For this piece, he had conflated references to an Aztec ruler who was tortured by fire during the Spanish conquest. And the 
the famous Buddhist monk who set himself ablaze in protest against the Vietnam War. And so Man on Fire really is Man on Fire. You can see, you know, this giant flame coming off of him. It's a very uh, gracious, beautiful work. And he's, this is not the only piece of his that deals with fire. He did a commission for a, a fire department um, commemorating dead uh, firemen that's just a giant blaze with two firemen fighting. He's he's depicted fire in a number of his works before, two-dimensional and three-dimensional. Number two is a twofer. Uh, two of our favorite Texas artists, Helen Altman and Katie Pell, have both uh, used ovens as a way to uh, throw out some heat in their artwork. Now, Katie Pell uh, died pretty recently, and Ruby City acquired this piece, and then Helen Altman's piece, uh, an oven that's also on fire, is at the Old Jail Art Center in Albany. I like that both of these are kind of conservation nightmares. Uh, Katie Pell's piece, you know, it's, she, she did a lot of work that commented on, uh, like, the perceived feminism and femininity so you know this oven is pink and the propane canister with it is pink and this oven is just radically violent and shoots flames out from like the top of the stove which is amazing and then Helen Altman's is maybe uh, playful in a safer way but it's still a conservation nightmare because it um it's like an old oven that incorporates lights to make it look like like flickering bulbs like you would put on your Christmas tree right to make it look like uh, the stove is working and the oven's working but then also there are pots on top of the stove that have tubing that runs through them that you fill the pot up with water the tubing makes bubbles and the bubbles come so it looks like water's boiling in the pots the way she uses materials is always pretty great um and it's it's no different in these. The first time I saw Helen's piece at the old jail, I was just astonished and I loved it immediately. But I love it because the, for those of us who grew up in Texas and live in Texas, the idea of having to cook on your stove in the middle of the summer, especially it's if, you, horrible. if you don't have air conditioner. But even if you do have air conditioning, it can actually be a lot. And I mean, even in a very air conditioned house, there can be a discussion like, are we going to turn the oven on today or not? Because... Ugh. And number one on our list is the photography of Early Hudnall Jr., a Houston-based uh, photographer who, uh, especially in the 80s and 90s, photographed um, Houston in the summertime often. Um, and the third ward, the fifth ward, um, these are amazing. And man, can you feel the heat? And we're here in Houston in the middle of summer, so it just seems right that this would be number one because we're feeling it. These are beautiful photographs. We had a, we ran a really nice piece on him by Gene Fowler. A lot of these photos came from uh, photographs he took during a Model Cities program. He falls into the kind of overarching umbrella of street photography that really documents how people are feeling and how communities see themselves. Um, and the fact that his photographs are happening in Houston, I mean, it, it adds a certain weight if you know that they are in Houston and you can kind of understand that environment. But I think it comes across even if you're just seeing his photographs for the first time and don't know who he is or where his subjects are. 